Well, that was fun. And now it's time to bring up, as I said, the greatest songwriter that ever lived. And the greatest song that's gonna live a long, long time. And his son, the next greatest song that ever lived, John D. Latimer and Mike Latimer. Come on up. Uh, this is the lazy man way of doing it. Okay. <laughs> but it doesn't hang on that top note that I sang. That was, let's do it again. No, no, I'm not. That was you saying that? No, no, that was God. Yeah. <laughs> he sang it the first time, too. Yeah. But that was a song. May I talk for a few minutes? Yeah. You see, we've got to make sure our cameras are situated. I, I, knew, uh, uh, I knew this man for 60 years. I'll tell you what, let me turn the spotlight around. Oh, thank you. I have something to show you. <laughs> my God, I've never had that done. <laughs> For the guy to turn the spotlight around that head is your Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what's the guilt on there. But that's okay. That's part of the distinction. Oh! <laughs> now that's all right. <laughs> We're gonna, uh, don't move that camera. We'll just turn that around. We'll take that big camera. Let's leave the, the U stream camera there. This is live radio, folks. We're on live radio and now. I love the camera woman. How about a hand for Lily? How about Lily Mike? She saved my life. And she is our cameraman. And she's bringing the camera. You can't get away from the camera, Johnny. You can't get away from the camera. That's right. She's a camera lady. She's hardly. I've been practicing this for a long time. Uh, I considered uh, singing that song at uh, your father's funeral because it was written about a funeral. Uh, a concept back when my friend started dying years ago, and uh, it was it was it was it's a wonderful lyric. Yeah. And uh, so I've read. I've always wondered what inspired that. I never well, that. your friends though, when they start dying, you start calling for your friends to come to you and hang around you because it's your time. Yeah. And uh, so it was a funeral type uh, deal, but just go ahead and have a seat, darling. And, uh, <laughs> Pardon me for calling guys just slightly younger than me, darling, but I've got three three darlings for sons, yeah. and they grew up with you all. And uh, sitting in those trees. Uh, <laughs> today I may tune up, but that's okay. Hell, it's free American. You can tune up if you want to. And, uh, some of us can. <laughs> some of us can. Uh, that's a musical thing. But uh, George, let's say, I've written a thing. Okay, it starts. Um, um, I have to get it to start turning the page. Uh, it's um, he's eating grits and eggs and bacon in the cottage he has taken. He's just starting to awaken over yonder on the other side. Yeah. Over yonder, past the mountains, where the stars are in the sky. Over yonder, on the other side. He's just got a jet black, brand new town car. And put gold, brand new golden strings on his old guitar. He, anywhere he is, he'll be a star. He's over yonder, especially on the other side, where he'll be a star. And the, where the stars pass the valleys, where the stars are shining in the sky, over, over yonder on the other side. Now, I haven't written the rest of it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is a world premiere, I think. Because I, I, I haven't gotten old enough to write the rest of it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a main thing to understand if you're going to understand art. It goes all the way through your life. It doesn't stop when you're 50 and your voice starts jumping from one mountaintop across a valley to another mountaintop. Uh, you just quieten down the spaces and you say, friends of mine, not friends of mine. Now I learned that the hard way. <laughs> And that's, why, and that's why I'm not singing what I'm saying today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, yeah but this photo, you want to do an album of recitation. Well, yeah. uh, uh, the, well, uh, whatever. I, I, I cannot consume that thought at this time. <laughs> well, you had a big breakfast today here at Kimbrough's. How was that food by Chef Michelle? It, well, what? Cause she's the only chef going. That's what right. say. <laughs> Is it worse food I ever ate? No. I, I recently ate it. Uh, well, I won't tell you. About that. My wife said, please don't. Please don't. Well, now, now something interesting, I see someone sitting, your lovely wife, Susan, is between you and a, an old-time friend. Now, who is that? You're going to be like now, my family today, introducing people. Now, uh, th this gentleman, he has his wife here. She's kept him straight all through his crazy years and put up with that shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've just found out, excuse the, the word, but I've just got had it on my mind because I had a, a little problem not long ago. <laughs> Uh, on Thanksgiving Day, in front of 34 people. Uh, but uh, that's okay, that happens. Uh, I had to get a little psychiatric care for it, but uh, other than that, and, and a good shoe shine, I was all right. <laughs> but uh, uh, this gentleman sitting next to, this is my wife. Uh, I want her. And, and her name is Susie, we've been married 43 years. George, George knew me before we got married, and George knew me after we got married. And uh, I'm going to talk today on the, the, the serious artistic aspects that he lended a real strong hand in, in determining the direction of the musical form that he chose to be his artwork. Uh, this goes across the seas and entails the whole entire earth that we do not understand when we think of country music. We are too close to it sitting here making it as, than we are to understand it. I'd like for her to explain to you now the Elizabethan <laughs> barn where this first story takes place with your father. Okay. Now Elizabeth and Bond was he did the BBC TV series. Yes. Now, now let me excuse me. Let me let me put uh, look this into perspective. When George was discovered, I've been in on on a lot of that stuff and his relationship with the English speaking world. That's not just England. That's South Africa. That's parts of Europe and Asia where they speak English, like America yeah. and the Canada, um, uh, and uh, so. Uh, I knew him a long time as he eased into this elevation that we're going to see George was, and that's what I'm trying to build here. That's why I'm taking a little time, because these are fans, and these are un the, you all will understand this, uh, where, where uh, you're on the very basic level down here with it happening. Uh, but if people that you will talk and tell to, they'll see uh, George's importance on the next level up, and the next level up, and the next level up, because he's not quit growing yet. Uh, now, what was I saying? Yes, <clears throat> BBC uh, was was controlled, and uh, it was, it was uh, president. He was the president. Of, the president of BBC Two was Phil Lewis, and he and his wife had a young family of ten to fourteen year old children. When he first heard George's repertoire and saw George's atmosphere and his dedication to his musical form, he saw it on an international level. He didn't see it on a national or a regional level, but he saw it on an international level. And he was the only one, he had 48 TV producers working under him. He did the big uh, wedding, the die, all the special stuff that England produces for its English-speaking world that it sends out uh, uh, English-oriented uh, culture to, the, to, the, to the, the guys out there who are just coming along in England and, and the uh, Western European culture. Um, and so, but he became a big friend of George's and a big fan of George's and would bring his, his family and put them right down in front when George had a concert and they would listen to the way the working class music should be and the, and the messages and the stories 
and the uh, the musical validity that a musical form such as country music should display. He didn't have Elvis. He didn't have people that were coming along at the same time as George, but he had guys who understood the story. Uh, George would sing a little sharp like Ernest Tubb at time and a little flat like Lester Flatwood at time. It was not intentional. It was in his general makeup of his bodily vocal machine. Because I said, George, you're flat on that. He said, but does the story get across? Yeah. He said, does the story get across? And that is the true essence of art. No matter what art you're into, is getting that story across. So, <clears throat> I went to the Elizabeth, uh, Elizabethan barn in England where Queen Elizabeth the first one lived in 1500. She lived there as one of her homes. And George did a, 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 a uh, the cameras were there, the big trucks and everything. He had an audience about 800 people. And he asked me to come over and to perform as his guest, which I did. We were sitting on two stools out front. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a stage like this, but it, the floor was, became the stage. And uh, while we were sitting on two stools together talking, <clears throat> a young lady came out from behind us dressed in a dress that Queen Elizabeth had uh, just been found up in the trunk in the, in the attic of the Elizabethan barn in a trunk and she had on this dress this original dress and she came up to the back of us and she kissed him on the back of the neck and patted me on the hip <laughs> and both of us turned around and saw this woman dressed in this uh, this low neck thing and I went down like that and George went up like this. <laughs> and there were photographs there were photographs of the, of of that being taken. This gentleman here <clears throat> I'll introduce you to shortly. Uh he's a photographer that uh George was his choice and Chad Atkins' choice and my choice and several other people's in town choice. And um, but this girl, <clears throat> so she said, "Welcome to the Elizabethan barn. I am the uh, uh, the in one imposter uh, who was the impostor. What is that word? Impositor. Impersonator. Impersonator. Who is in the dress today? <clears throat> I knew none of this history, and neither did George. I think I don't know how much he knew, but uh, he was." Uh, it, am I boring you all? No. no. Okay, okay, because you need to know this about a, a person so uh, artistically driven and so well equipped to get his story across. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over now to Susan and let her tell you about it. It's Queen Elizabeth. Yay! This is exactly what he hates having done to him is being dragged on stage unprepared. <laughs> uh, now they're really, really beautiful. I mean, it's, yeah. it's well, going to make a whole rest of it. Uh, well, uh, that he's told most of it, but uh, I want to say something about the Gang of Four in Nashville. Talk about a creative Gang of Four. Jimmy Moore, Chet Atkins, George Hamilton the Fourth, and John. And amongst them... Well, that's a handy Things happen, and Jimmy document it all and uh, we we've learned that we're so going Jimmy to the photographer here beside Jimmy you Moore, all kinds of covers for RCA on absolutely the and is the master of the black and white John is moving towards the table wait a minute there's a photo of towards yes. Africa and that's by Jimmy Moore by Jimmy Moore is that the cover of folks here or which album was that the cover of? I don't know it was okay. the first picture I made of in my basement <clears throat> but this is a traditional Classical picture and a posture that he took many times. Before. I'm going to hand these other covers to John D. And let me see. Somehow we're going to try to let you sit down so you can hold them up in front of this camera. Okay. I can stand up long enough to do No, but the camera. You need the camera. Oh, okay. This would be Jimmy Moore. Okay. How about that? Yay! Yay! Yeah. Show the back. Now this is it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I'm an M. It's all off. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Now, that is the back of that one. That's you and Chet and George the fourth. I'm going to get Mike to hand this to John D. I'm sorry, Mike. Now you're involved in all this excitement. <laughs> Maybe we'll hand it to the man of constant leisure. He is the man. This is an album cover that actually Jimmy did this cover, which is Jimmy's son and dog. And this became an award-winning album cover of the Billboard Magazine Award for the albums of that year on covers. You did this in Jimmy Wall. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad they didn't take that after his death, man. Yeah. He looks ghostly. Look at that. He looks ghostly. Yeah. Now, if you can hand that in front. Oh, you got the lens. There's our cameraman. All right. Camera lady. Camera lady, I know. But we have fun with the backwards word. How about I have her, John? Well, we'll show these later. Okay. We have more work for you. Now, during the flight, John will stand up and show you where the oxygen tanks were lowered from the ceiling in case we lose pressure during the show. <laughs> and now we continue our regular, our regular broadcast with Susan Loudabout. How about Susan? First of all, first of all she was educated at... Uh, which was no, she, she was educated uh, David. In, at David Lipscomb, yeah. where they had to learn a religious history and a secular history. Think of the, of the quality of that uh, yeah. understanding. Well, regardless of what your football. <laughs> where, I, where I kind of fit in here is I'm, I'm like uh, uh, Julius Caesar had the slave behind him whispering in his ear saying, Glory is fleeting. I whisper things in his ear and say, Oh, tell him the one about. So we were laughing on the way over here. John had so many things. He said, I don't know how to narrow it down to talk about George. And different things would come to mind. And, and I said, Oh, tell him about the time y'all were photobombed by Queen Elizabeth I. Wow. Yeah. And uh, he didn't know the term. And I said, I think that's when somebody, you're trying to take a selfie and somebody just appears in the background. So there they were in the Elizabethan barn on that occasion. And he said, we known we had known each other so long. He said, uh, George is the one who, he said, I, I wrote things, but George is the one who got on the plane and took it out there and took it to every country and met people at every rank. I know one of his dear uh, kinsmen and, and friends is the Duke of Hamilton that we yeah. met at your, at, at your folks' house. And... Um, Don't get on that, I have something to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, yeah, and what about the time y'all met Queen Elizabeth? And we said, the first. And uh, that was the occasion in the Elizabethan barn where they had staged the, uh, television, the, show. the television show on one of the series uh, that, that George had over there. He had John over for his guest, and the repartee, you know, they'd start out to behave and say something that, that was on script, and things would happen. Meanwhile, somebody had put this lady up to, who apparently appeared at the... Uh, I'd like to explain that. And, and she showed up behind him. Yeah, <laughs> All right, here it is. Yeah. Hey, this, is this is totally uh, unrehearsed. We have no cues. We don't know where to You can be on our show every week then. Well, I, 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 totally I, I, like I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, uh, I enjoy the moment of it because it cuts down on my psychiatric care. <laughs> But now here we are in this big room, uh, and this girl shows up behind us dressed in a 500-year-old dress, and she kisses George on the back of the neck and, and, and pinches my bottom, and, and I turn her, both of us turn around and look at her, and we wonder what the joke is, because here's a nut loose out in an old dress. <laughs> And people started clapping, the audience, and they started pulling their cameras out. And uh, somebody, and she said, this dress had just been found in a trunk in the barn of the Elizabethan attic, Elizabethan attic, and we wanted to introduce it to the world through this. And so I understood what the deal was. And, I, and so people started getting up out of the audience and coming and sitting down in front of George's me on that stool. Uh, on those stools, and they sat around us, and this girl walked around us and sat down in front of us. Now, when you think of the social justice that she's been doing, that she did there, uh, bringing the working class and the elite class somewhat close together, because it's real spread out over there. 
Your, uh, who was that fellow, Hamilton? What was he, his kinship to you? Uh, Angus, the Duke of Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. the Duke of Hamilton. Yay! He, now, this is, now, this is where George came from. George's bloodline reaches back to that guy who was a lord, and he was in the House of Lords at one time. And he came over here to visit you all, and he told he asked me in the living room, is this, where, where is a comfortable chair in here? I said, you have to make it. So we took a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a pad off of the couch and put it against the door, and I told him how the Indians sat cross-legged, which was a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> but, but he believed it. He believed it. He was supposed to believe it. <laughs> and, uh, and so, that, that's heavier than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but he sat down cross-legged, and you may remember, and he said, this is comfortable. And I said, that's what we were trying to tell you back in the 1700s. <laughs> Get the hell out of our life and let us have our own churches. Man. And don't bring that Louis XIV stuff in on us, tell us how we got to dress up in robes and stuff. We want to handle snakes and heal people, man. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and he said, I'm beginning to understand that. <laughs> and I said, well, we'll see how you act. <laughs> and so this was the guy that I don't know if you know it or not, but when Alger Hiss left Germany in the Second World War and flew his private plane to, your, to, your, to uh, Hamilton's estate and landed on his front yard, he was trying to give Germany to the English and get Hitler out of there. Yeah, somebody and, said the Duke of Hamilton's father was a pilot, and they had, yeah, they met each other in the international exactly air right. show. Now, uh, he, uh, he told me, Hamilton told me, that he was given a part of that airplane. Wow. Do you remember it? Yeah. Oh, fine. It, it I've through. never seen it. Actually, my lovely wife, I think, has seen it. Okay. Oh. She had not well, fine. My mother may have seen it. It's fine. It. it belongs to you. Yeah. Uh, and so... Um, but Alger Hiss wound up in jail the rest of his life. In the Tower of London. Yeah. yeah. But that happened in your family. So your father came from those roots over to America and was born into the middle class. His father was an executive but with the goodies had a headache powder. If you really want to get deep, guess what? What? The only way he got over there was because of you, because you started all that music for him. Well, how about that? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, but see, I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. I was following things I didn't yeah. understand. Yeah. Like you have well, to. You said Plato. If you're, if Plato uh, was believes in things he can't see. Well, Plato, the reason why we're platonic and believe in music is because it is not visible yet. Yeah. Aristotle didn't believe in anything but what was visible. Yeah. Plato believed in the mystic and what was not visible. Yeah. That's the reason we're platonic in the arts over here. And I wanted your, your, your kinsman to know that he, by getting out of our damn way, he allowed a reason for the working class to come up and illustrate itself with his music yeah. instead of being de delegated to folk singers who ain't got any damn sense. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, and pardon my cussing, I cannot make expressions without it. It's for emphasis. But, but your father never cussed, unless he cussed you in private. No. He cussed him in private. <clears throat> but he never cussed. I never heard him say one cuss word. Not one cuss word. And I use the subject all the time. <laughs> Maybe that's because we matched. Yeah. Hey, is this boring, y'all? Yeah. No. Okay. I, can I play this song and find out where this came from? I want to play uh, this song that you wrote. Uh, just a little bit of it, because I sang it to you on the phone the other night. It was me, because I said, do you remember this song called Little World Girl? Yeah, okay. And you went to get your lyric book. I had forgotten the second verse. George IV recorded this. It was very interesting, because it went up to... Uh, I guess it was up about number 18 on the country, mainstream country in America charts back in the 60s. Yeah. Hurry up, we're losing them. And then they were going to win the number two in Canada. So I'll do this, do but it. I'll let you tell a little bit of the story about this, then Mike's going to start okay. doing some real music. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 
I'll just do a verse with you. You join the crowd, you try to thing out the town. You get down to the park and then in the dark found new friends. You become a part of what used to startle you, huh? And now you are what you swore you would not become. Little world girl, you've gone away and left us all in Idaho Falls. And moved to LA. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to send the second verse just for yes, the yeah. It's a oh, short song. Oh. How about a hand for me? Your thoughts were too deep for the man in the street to dig. The buttons and signs you wore of the times were too big. Check on the greyhound and babe, send me a wire. We'll solve the world's problems on an Idaho farm by the fire. Little world girl, summer is gone. Winter is here. I need you near. Come on back home. This is my favorite part. La 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 do you know what la 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 means? No. That's Kashik Records for Platonic Thought. That's Kashik Records where everything is written in yeah. mankind's history. Yeah. That's out there in the uh, somewhere that that you get when you dream and pray yeah. and meditate. Yeah. That's where that came from, and you have placed the story in the song. So you co-wrote the song. This is the magic of art. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. What George, your daddy, cannot, could not understand. I tried to explain this to him, and he would understand the story, but yeah. he didn't understand the arrangement. You produced many of his albums, many of his songs. You wrote tons and tons of songs, and you also produced three sons who were all very talented. Only one of them is here with us today, but it is the one and only Mike Latimer. Can you guys introduce Mike? Can you introduce Mike? And, uh, he's gonna. Do you want to sing or play an instrumental first? Uh, let's do uh, uh, instrumental. Whatever you want to do. Yeah. He may play one of an instrumental because you. Well, this is an interesting story. You talked on our show before about how Mike would not learn guitar from you, but you taught guitar to Susan and might learn guitar from soon. That's exactly right. Now why did that happen, I do not know. But let me finish the story before we go into this next one. <laughs> this must be finished because the little girl in the 500 year old dress came in and sat down in front of us and I said, well she deserves a song. And half the audience were behind us with their cameras or in, behind her. And uh, George sang two songs to her. One was, Jesus loves the little children. Wow. And no, uh, I thought that was very nice for a little girl in a yeah. big woman's dress. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> then to, he sang a Rosie Baby Ruth. And three Baby Ruth bar, uh, three roses came up out of the audience and was given to all three of us. We gave our roses to her. And George reached in his pocket and had a baby Ruth bar in his pocket <laughs> and gave it to her. Now, where did all that come from? 
it came from the great writer of it all, and your father was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. How about having yeah. 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 And you know you're going to make me start crying. Well, I, uh, it's, a, it's a crying deal. All right. If you don't cry, then you're in the long, wrong element of country music. That's country right. Country music's made to cry to. Well, it was me when, when everything sort of came together in September. I remember people, I would call them. We were trying to organize the memorial service, uh -huh. the celebration. And I would call people and I'd say, well, it's crying time again. You know, it's not That's say, exactly it's, right. It's, I can't understand you, but <laughs> it is me. You had said to me, though, you said you got to keep laughing. Country oh, yeah, or you'll cry. Exactly. If you don't keep laughing, you'll cry. Yeah. And sometimes when you get into laughing and crying, you've touched the heart string. Yeah. That's where it all happens. Yeah. I'm so glad we're in the art that we're in. And George was a star within this art form. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that uh, finalizes that story. Uh, the little girl broke into tears. Little world girl, yeah. Yeah, no, she's the little prince of the little Queen Elizabeth. Did you write this song about her? No, no, no. Uh, this was before I had uh, yeah. I'd been there. Yeah. But this was so important as your father. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, in t uh, a couple more deals with him where he shined. People used to say, George is gone all the time. Does he have another family in England? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard that? Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. Well, we were staying with Phil and Di, the president of the BBC World Service, and we walked down the street, and here a little ch a church front was in the buildings, and we went in there, and there was a sign about this big saying, George Hamill's fourth concert. He opened up his case. He sang for about twice as many people as are here, and when he got through, he did his, he put his guitar up and he did mm -hmm. photographs and autographs. And on the way back, and they passed the plate and people put money in the plate and he handed the plate to the preacher. Wow. And we walked out and he said, you've heard stories about me having families in other parts of the world. This is my family mm -hmm. in Henley on the time. Yay! He said, I have three more families in England like this. I have four families in Ireland, six families in uh, Scotland. You're not saying that we shouldn't be talking about our youth. <laughs> <laughs> Something bigger than me is talking. Yeah. 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 And, and so uh, he said, Germany has families. I have, and the Finland, I have families. And he said, I just wanted to make clear what kind of families we yeah. had. Yeah. And the, this is when Phil Lewis, that night at the dinner table, asked me in front of George, said, I saw him take up uh, uh, money in, the, in, the, in a church, said, is he down to that? <laughs> and I said, no, he's up to that. Yeah. And, I said, and I said, if you weren't in such an Episcopalian, you'd be, if you were a, a fundamentalist, you'd understand that. Yeah. And he understood that. Yeah. <laughs> Man. He called and uh, for your fa your fa your daddy's funeral, and said, "Tell him yeah. that Phil and I and I are thinking about him." And he sent over the, the what was the guy's name? The Tony Bauer. Tony Bauer. And Tony Bauer is actually watching us today, so let's all turn around. Well, hey, hey, Tony. He may be in Texas going to Oklahoma, but he well, said well, to say hello to well, you. Well, Tony. Now. Well, uh, he understood because we talked about this. Yeah. Uh, during the funeral, I may say. Well, I was sitting beside you on the side of the stage. It was just—it was so much like being on a, on the Wabash Cannonball, taking a final ride. It was beautiful. Just yeah. being there, watching it all. It was a wonderful, wonderful yeah. time. And the things you said. It was too. bigger than the Wabash Cannonball. Yeah. 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 Roy understood the art, but he didn't know why. Yeah. Well, you wrote for Roy's publishing company for a while. Yeah. Acre of Rose. But, you think but so your dad things. understood why. Yeah. That's why he chose the the the, the uh, classic the classics of the uh, uh, the classifications yeah. of stratifications of social attitude. He realized on all three because he came out of the top. He lived in the middle and sang to the lower. He understood the full spectrum of human existence. That's why your dad was wise. Well, you know, the thing I've often heard it said that if there's anybody who's like,
both John D. and George IV. It would have to be Mike Lanamel. <laughs> Now, can you introduce Mike and tell us something he might do? Not, not now. <laughs> We're going to do a song that John D. wrote. Well, of course. Well, and this is one that you wrote for the Almond Joys. And George IV then ended up recording it. The Almond Joys with the Almond Brothers. And now it's time for Mike's talk. That's uh, so, so interesting. I've heard a lot of these stories before, but I've, I've never tired of, of, of hearing about them. And uh, we want to do this one now. Uh, poor George Dad, this is, uh, this is yours you wrote. Oh, I'll go ahead and sing with Songwriter and a singer, and also a guitar player. <laughs> How do you do that? Well, I, I want to do this. Can I yeah. do one more? Yeah. Uh, uh, an instrumental that, uh, that uh, Dad wrote years ago that uh, Chet had a big, uh, yeah. a big hit on. It's called Windy and Warm. <laughs> Wait, it gets better. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is about George the Fourth. Now, this is not about us. But George the Fourth understood generational growth in an art form. That's why he's proud of you. And this is why this is a lot of burden on you. Uh, tell the nice man, thank you. <laughs> because I understand that. All right. Now, Mike, don't put the guitar up. Yeah. Please. <laughs> Uh, just, just to show you what gen one generation wrote, yeah. and then to show you what the next generation yeah. has written yeah. within the same art form is is a is kind of a a, 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 a a heavy thing to 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 show. But these people here understand. Uh, pardon me for calling you these people, but but you all know what you're talking about when you're dealing on the, on a level like this. Mike played the piece that you played this morning, but I've never heard it. Uh, now, also while he's getting ready for that, remember what was so fun for me in that I tried to replicate, but I could never do it. On break my mind, you sang the harmony part of the second verse, I believe, and I tried to sing that with you. Well, I couldn't and hear. Was, I couldn't hear the volume. Yeah. I didn't know if I was too loud or too. Soft. No, you were right. Yeah, but it was so neat to be with Mike Labatt singing that song that John D. wrote. George the Fourth recorded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I just wanted this is a good uh, a good place for musicologists yes. to understand what they're into with the formality of country music. It is not a lower form of music. Just yeah. like blues is not a lower form of yeah. music. Uh, this this is a very. Uh, valid form of music and we got to understand that here in Nashville before we can understand it anywhere else. The rest of the world is already understanding it. Yeah. Through your father, through the help of the BBC World Service which sent his rec his his uh, 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 his film his, his series of music out to everybody in the world who spoke English. Yay! So, and that is me, and I won't say much, but uh, on a plane I was flying back from a tour I did standing in for my father uh -huh. for the month of October, November uh -huh. over in England and Scotland. Uh -huh. And I got on a plane and I had a little guitar I borrowed from, you know, my father gave it to me a while back and I carried it with me, stuck it on the plane. Uh -huh. So I took it back to England. He used that in the TV shows over there. Uh -huh. And there was a gentleman who sat beside me with his wife. And they were, uh, it's hard to believe anybody's older than me. Of course, I look like I'm 23. But anyway, the thing Continue is... Continue on your thoughts, Hoss. You're losing Yeah. Well, watch this. Yeah, George. As I put the guitar over here, they told me you can't put that up there. I said, oh, you can. And yeah. the older gentleman said to me, is that a guitar? And I said, yes, it is. I hope <laughs> it is for a while, you know. Yeah. And he put his jacket on top. He said, don't worry, I have lots of guitars. I live on the Shetland Islands. And uh, he said he had some Martin guitars, all kinds of things. Uh -huh. So as we were flying along, uh, he said, well... What do you do? I say, I play music. My name is George Hamilton. He said, your father is George Hamilton IV. And I said, yeah. And this was just total coincidence this happened. This man said, your father did so much to trace the roots of country music back to the British Isles. There you go. And it was very interesting. It's bouncing back and forth and back and forth. It's all about that research, all about the heritage and exactly all about the musicology. Right. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, and you just run into the, <laughs> you run in by mistake. Yeah. Well, maybe it's not by mistake. And the people who remind you of Nothing why we're here. Nothing is by mistake. Yeah. But it's, country music is really, it's actually a good music form, you know. Well, you know, up, like up there sits the polishers of this form. Yeah. And then your guys will polish it over you. Mike, play the next generation yes. of the guitar from from the Windy and War. <laughs>
Hallelujah. So now, but once again, you did not teach Mike. Susan told him how to play like that. <laughs> I want to hear you play next time, Susan. We're going to have our special guest on. We're going to ask Jimmy Moore real quick just to tell us a little bit about Chet Atkins and Chet Atkins' office and George the Fourth and John. Then we're going to have more special guests to follow. It's hard to follow you all. You know that. How about a hand for one of John D. Lottebeck and Michael Allen. Now, if you would pass the microphone to Jimmy Moore. Yeah. Jimmy Moore is right over here. Jimmy Moore, you took, which, can you tell us really quick? So you did Jesse Coulter. I love this story about how Jesse met Chet Atkins. Yes. You were there with Chet at RCA Studio A that Aubrey Preston has just saved that building down that new road. How about Aubrey Preston at Studio A? So now we're going to go inside the actual, the eye of the hurricane of RCA Studio A building, Chet Atkins' office, on a night when Wayne Jennings brought somebody by to meet Chet. Yes, uh, Chet and I were upstairs in his office. We were always sitting there talking about photography. Yeah. He didn't want to talk about music with me because he knew I couldn't play. But we hear this banging on a door. And uh, we, but before that, the phone rang. Wayland says, I'm going to bring somebody over there that I want you to meet. So he hung it up and he said, I should wait on bringing somebody over here. So we start talking, and he's talking, and we, got, we forgot about it. And then we heard the banging on the door. We get down there, and Waylon's face is pressed against that plastic, I mean, that little bitty glass. <laughs> glass square, yeah. And Chad opens the door. Of course, Chad does things slow motion kind of. <laughs> and he says, what y'all do, go to sleep? <laughs> and Chad said, no, we, we just... Time flew, you know. Yeah. He comes in and Jesse's with him and he said, This is Jesse Coulter and, and I want you to hear her play on that grand piano. And Jet said, Fine. So she gets over there and she plays Christ softly and two or three of her things. Yeah. And we were just amazed. She had this beautiful white dress and, and uh, Chet says, I think we got a star or something. Mm -hmm. And the next day Chet called me and says, I'm gonna shoot Jesse's album cover this week. Yeah. 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 Is that an album cover where she was it? Uh, is she wearing a lace dress or which? What was yeah, that? it was like a show dress, but it's, yeah. she dressed that way then. I guess yeah. just, they'd been somewhere. Yeah. But the main thing I wanted to say about John and, and and your dad George is that those two people had more to do with my success in music than anybody. The encouragement and all this, but when John introduced me to Chet. John called me, we went out, he said, let's go, I want you to meet somebody. They always say, we want to meet somebody. Yeah. We go in the back door, we go through, and Chet's sitting there in his office, and John said, <clears throat> he said, hey, it's Chet, and Chet, hey, he said, I want you to meet somebody. <laughs> he said, this is Jimmy Moore, the best damn photographer in the world, and you're a damn fool if you don't use him. And Chet just kind of leaned back and said, well, I don't want to be a damn fool. <laughs> That's where it started. Yeah, wow. So you done? You did Dolly Parton's covers, maybe? And uh, did, did you do for the covers for Willie Nelson? Willie and Waylon and wow. all those guys. And and it was because Chet says go over there to Jimmy's place, or he called me over there. Felton Jarvis, yeah. you know, was my friend, and and uh, it just became. I wasn't just the photographer. I, I felt like I it was included in those people's lives with memories and pictures and trips and learning how to do things with them, you know. I can, can I tell the people that you're actually, you're writing a, a, the story of your life now for Simon and Schuster, who have Hello. come to you. How about that? Yeah. 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 My wife hopes that I will uh, live long enough to finish the life story. You're yeah. yeah. making more stories, you know, then you have to more time to add more stories. That yes, it is. is. <clears throat> very, very neat. Well, now, one thing, I, I'm not putting him on the spot, but it's very interesting. We have Omore College here in Franklin. Yes. And they have a photo photography area, and they have a, I do letterpress there with Tom Commodore Soundman. How about Tom the Soundman? <laughs> and what's so interesting with the history of RCA Studio A and sort of the connection with Aubrey Press and Leapers, Fort Williamson County, and Omore College of Design here in Franklin, I've sort of come up with this idea that I was going to try to see if Jimmy Moore might do some kind of showing of Many of his photos, his album photos. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I'd like to do that. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have Jimmy Moore here. In fact, you live in Lawrenceburg. Yes. And you lived there all your life. Yes. Uh, so you used to well, drive. all his life. You know, he hadn't lived all his life. Yet. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, 
George used to call us, my wife and I, and say, can I come down there and have my picture made? And I said, he's a star. Already, he don't know it. You know, and he I said, sure. Was. So he first time he came, he said, we're eating, and he said, that's good. And he said, uh, you know, uh, we talked about dessert. And he said, my favorite dessert is chocolate eclair. And Amy Jean says, that's funny, because that's what I just made for dessert. <laughs> so then on, when he say he's coming down, he says, is she going to make chocolate eclair? <laughs> As he left, as he left, he put two or three in his pocket and I said, you wouldn't mind leaving one, would you, George? <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's, I, I know all many stories about your dad, and, and they're all, like he said, he never cussed. And we were climbing a bluff one day where we made a bunch of pictures, and it ain't easy to climb a bluff with a guitar and me with cameras. So we're climbing up through there, and I slipped and hit my knee really bad, and I said one of those words, his description words or expression, and your dad looked at me and said, louder milk. <laughs> Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for coming out today. And on the George Hamilton the Fourth Facebook page, as Facebook.com is me, George Z Four, because uh, everybody had taken George the Fourth and all that stuff. So it's George Z Four. I'll be putting up this wonderful article you wrote, a remembrance of George the Fourth after he passed away. And unfortunately, I was busy in the eye of the hurricane, I guess, or whatever. We didn't, you, we didn't have a chance to invite you down to the memorial service at the bottom of the tour because those photographs you would have taken would have been legendary, you know. Because you have put, I can, it's interesting to see Nashville through the eyes of you. And that's what, if you can come to Omore, or if you can, have you got a website? No. Uh, okay. But you, you have about two million negatives of photographs of Johnny Cash, maybe the Johnny Cash show. Yeah, I have pictures that he never did see because he yeah. wanted me to take extra ones yeah. and not give them to ABC. And I said, is that is that okay? He said, I'm Johnny Cash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I found the pictures and we never looked at all of them. They were yeah. in a hurry to get them, you know. Do you write a regular column for the Lawrenceburg newspaper? I'll write a, a column, and what it is is some of the stories that are going to be in my book shortened a little bit for public reaction, and we've had good reaction. In fact, I got a lot of calls about George. You know, they all wanted to get more pictures of him. I'm going, well, we'll see. Well, we're trying to put some links up on George the Fourth's Facebook site and on the Viva Nash Vegas radio site so people can find you online because, I mean, you are, what's fun is you're like a, a discovery. Well, I've been hiding, writing your yeah. story <clears throat> makes you hide because you think, I don't remember doing that and I can't write about it. Yeah! <laughs> and okay. while at, 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 uh, at Chet's uh, memorial at yeah. the Ryman, I, was, I went back to the <clears throat> back and it said family only, and I turned around and come back up and I met George, and yeah. George says, where are you going? I said, well, that's for family. He said, you're family, yeah. let's go. So we went in together. Yeah. Waylon's sitting there and he said, Hoss, I hear you're writing a story about the music business. I said, yeah. He said, you're not going to write everything, are you? <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm not going to write the bad stuff. Yeah. Although I thought everything he'd done had been in the paper anyway. But, <laughs> but he, said, he said, if you do, I'll dig out of the grave and choke you to death. How about a hand for Jimmy Moore? Come on. Now what I'm going to do, this is interesting. People will be writing about this all week long and maybe even for two or three weeks.